everyone, and welcome to another of my tabletop gaming lectures. I am Jason Bullman. I'm the director of game design at Paizo. I'm also the publisher of uh, Minotaur Games, a tiny little uh, personal imprint where I kind of play around and do my own projects. I've done card games there. I've done role-playing game supplements. But lately, I've been building tile sets for Roll20. And today, what I'd like to do is show you how I uh, use those tiles to make fun and engaging maps on Roll20. So uh, for those of you who don't have uh, Roll20, uh, you can get an account for free, um, although you are limited in what types of games you can set up and, and what things you can build until you pay for uh, an account. Uh, I have the, the high-level account, so I can kind of do it all. Uh, but uh, today what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to use uh, the various tile sets and set up your pages and, and drop the tiles in there to make fun and engaging map environments. And we're really gonna focus on probably just doing two quick, uh, easy, fun little maps. Uh, nothing too complicated, um, but uh, I figured folks might wanna see some of the ways that I use these tiles to build maps because uh, I built them in a very specific way so that uh, you could use them to really maximize the amount of flexibility and customization you can get out of them. So to get us started here, um, here we are on, on, on Roll20, and I, I just created a game that's just building maps on Roll20, and I'm going to go ahead and launch this game. Um, so we'll get this launched. And, uh, you know, once you launch your game, you're going to have, uh, you know, just kind of, you're not going to have any, uh, any games in here. Uh, you've got one map with nothing on it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and customize this map. And just to make it simple, I'm going to drop down the size down to 10 by 10. Now, one of the things that I made blue maps is the blue maps use one color of blue. They use some different gradations of it, but it's fundamentally one color of blue. So if you set your background color to that one color of blue, your tiles will all sit in the background seamlessly. So the first thing you want to do is set your background color here to 4493BE. That's the hexamal hexadecimal code for the color blue that I use. Now, for this map, I'm gonna start out by doing uh, some playing around with the town map. So I'm gonna to wanna to leave um, lighting kind of fully on. So we're not gonna turn on any uh, dynamic lighting or anything like that. So we're just gonna go and do that. So now we've got a 10 by 10 blue map. And you can see all the grid lines on there. We're gonna keep those on there for now. Um, later on, I suggest Generally speaking, when using these map tiles, I generally suggest going in here and turning the opacity of your lines all the way down to zero. And when you do that, they vanish. They're still there, everything will still snap to grid, but they won't be visible. The tiles themselves, generally speaking, have line indicators on them, so you don't need them. But that said, while we're building, it helps to be able to see them, so we're gonna go ahead and leave it on just for the time being. So, there they are. Now, if you've picked up the uh, blue map map tiles, um, what you're going to want to do is get them into your library. And, and the way you can do that is if you look them up in your premium assets uh, under things you have purchased, you can just copy them over to your library. There's an option in there to copy them over, and that'll cause them to pop in. Now, you're seeing everything I have loaded in here, which is stuff for Band of Bravos and all kinds of stuff. But the top three things are the blue map sets, the town tile set, the dungeon tile set, and the cavern tile set. So uh, I'm going to start out by building some stuff in town. Now, the first thing we're going to do is lay down flooring. Um, that is the easiest way to build using this set. I find that when I do that, I have a much easier time. So there's two base flooring uh, patterns in here. One is for like a warehouse. It's giant, big, clunky boards. Another one is uh, smaller, finer boards. So we're going to go ahead and start dragging those in. But before we do that, we're going to go ahead and drop ourselves down to the map and background layer. Um, the layering in Roll20 is super useful. Um, this is the best way to keep yourself sane while you're playing. If you put all the stuff that isn't supposed to move on the map and background layer, and then play mostly in the object and token layer, you don't have to worry about accidentally grabbing the background and moving it around. There's going to be points where you use that as an exception, but generally speaking, you shouldn't. Uh, now, the upside is these also look, work like entirely separate layers within the uh, program itself. So the map and background layers are always below the object and token layers. All of them are. 
but within the map and background layers, you can have depth. You can have things behind one another. That's going to be really important later. But for right now, let's change over to the map and background uh, layer. And then we're just going to take our wooden floor and drag it in and drop it. Now, these generally speaking shouldn't com come in one by one. Sometimes I notice the program drops them in two by two. So go ahead and rescale that down to one by one. I'm going to go ahead and copy it and paste it. Now, one little trick is when you're laying down a lot of these, it's best to grab everything you have copied and paste it up to that point and continue the process because that way you are getting all of the pieces faster and faster. Because the one thing about the blue tiles is they are designed, they're here to make your uh, map environments as flexible and customizable as possible. The upside to that is you can build whatever you want, whatever layout you imagine you can build. It's like a set of Legos. You can kind of customize them and drop them and pop them together in whatever order you need to make your adventure work. The downside to that is you have to put down a lot of Legos to make things function. So every tip and trick that you can find to make that go faster is going to make your life a little easier. So uh, eventually you get to the point where you just got a lot of them. And you don't need to keep uh, uh, grabbing all eight and moving them around. I'm just going to build a little house here. Nothing, nothing too, nothing too fancy. I just want a little uh, home that I can play around with because I'm building, I'm building a house. So um, yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm pretty happy with that. Let me, let me drop down one or two more. And we will go ahead and copy this set again. We'll paste that onto here. And there we go. So let's call that our floor plan for right at the moment. So the second thing you're going to want to do is drop down to the town wall exterior pieces. Now, the key with these pieces is that these help firm up the outside wall and transition from the inside of your building to the outside. So uh, there's a lot of these pieces. Um, they vary in different types. There is stone and grass. So I'm going to go ahead and take a stone uh, corner here. We're going to assume that the building faces out onto cobblestones. And we're going to go ahead and get these in here and we'll just rotate them around to make them work. There are exterior corner post pieces. And then there is just kind of flat wall pieces. And again, you know, you can copy these and paste them down. Now I'm going to leave one empty because there is a special tile for the entrance. We're going to go ahead and grab that. We're going to go ahead and put that down. Okay. So uh, I just realized that I want a little bit more space in the front of my building. So I'm going to go ahead and select the entire building. And I'm just going to move it up a square. Give myself a little bit more room down here on the bottom. That also allows me to transition into streets. So the town set includes uh, kind of cobblestone walkways and then street tiles as well. And the street tiles are more dense. Um, they're a bit more solid. You can kind of see those over here on the right. The, the cobbling is a bit more uh, solid and dense. So I'm going to go ahead and put uh, down a few of these. Now, there's not an infinite number of patterns here, but they do all lock together so that when you put them together, they look seamless. The only challenge with that is that sometimes it can start to look repetitive. Because when you do large series of patterns that are, you know, basically exactly the same token or tile, uh, eventually the human eye starts picking up on that and can tell that uh, you are replicating the same piece. Now, there are a few ways that you can fix that. One is just by flipping horizontal. That'll break it up enough. If you flip a piece horizontal or two here and there, um, that'll break up the eye line enough so that your brain won't be able to pick up on the pattern. So I'm going to go ahead and put down a few more of these and I could be duplicating them, right? You know, in larger number, make it go faster. Uh, 
I've noticed that when you get to the edge, it kind of bunches pieces up a bit. So... There we go. We almost got our street built. I'm going to go ahead and grab four of these. Copy and paste them here. I grabbed a few pieces. There's uh, two pieces. One has a little uh, sewer grate on the edge. That's kind of nice. So we'll copy that and we'll uh, paste that down. So there. I now have a cobblestone street down in front of my house. Fun. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, copy, paste. I'm going to continue this process, outlining the outside of the building. And uh, as I make my way around, I'm going to want to transition so that the backyard is grass. And to that end, there's a tile piece that's going to allow me to do that. I'm going to want to flip it vertically, though, so that it fits. And basically, that's going to allow me to change so that the backyard is uh, just grass. Plain cobblestones. These aren't attached to any building or street at all. And you can start playing around with that on the edges here too. There's a there's a variety of pieces that transition between cobble and grass. Um, I like to use them to kind of create more interesting spaces. Now, one thing that I did find out uh, you can do pretty easily um, is create kind of a very thin little cobblestone walkway uh, by putting like two of these back to back, but I don't have the space for it here on this side. And this one was flipped horizontal. We'll flip it back. And there, we've got the front. Now we transition uh, to uh, grass pieces. And once again, we've got exterior pieces uh, for the building that are grass as well. Uh, again, this just comes down to building the pieces and slapping them into place. Um, there are, you know, corner pieces. Uh, both interior and exterior corner pieces, right? Because those are going to be uh, used differently. Um, and we're almost we're almost set here. But one thing that I think we want to do is we want to have a cellar door somewhere. But uh, where to put it? I think right here is probably the right spot to put it. So let's target that spot for a cellar door. So we're going to go ahead and grab the cellar door piece. Move that into place. So now we have a cellar door. That looks great. I actually found that uh, building things with the town set is uh, quite a bit uh, more time consuming in general than building with the dungeons and cavern set because you're filling up almost every uh, square with background, right? Uh, you're laying down grass, you're laying down cobbles, you're laying down all sorts of stuff. That's going to take you a little longer. So when you're building uh, town set stuff, you're going to want to limit your scope a little, right? Only build what you need. Uh, and then uh, you're going to want to uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, plan a little extra time. Nothing wrong with that. So... We're almost done with the exterior here. Then things start to pick up. Uh, once you're kind of through this component, um, your next stage uh, really does, is all about just kind of decorating. 
Um, there is uh, something useful to having a bit of a, of a decorating flair here. Uh, now, one thing I want to do is I think I'm going to denote this area over here as the kitchen. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a fireplace right now and just make sure I've, I've left a space for it. So that's a good spot for it. Um, but I'm going to want to put a grass tile down behind it. So let me go grab one of those. Now, this is once again what, the first time that we've hit that point where the layering within a layer is important. So I put down the fireplace first, that put it down. Every tile you put after it is technically higher in the layer stack. So you're gonna to wanna to move those pieces around. So I'm gonna go ahead and send this to the back and that gets this to pop in the right way and it looks right and you know, no problem. Uh, that is one of the most useful and underutilized tools on here. Oh. is uh, the ability to layer your pieces. Um, being able to layer the pieces is really one of the t things that makes this, this software special. Um, I have a background in uh, CAD. I used to be an architect um, back before I got into gaming. And uh, so I have a, I have a, I have a background in, in computer-aided design, uh, the software for that. And as a result, this is pretty intuitive to me. Um, doesn't quite work like CAD, but some of the tools are pretty similar for those of you with experience. Um, just, you know, layers and, you know, moving tools and things like that. Um, so there we go. We now have uh, all of our flooring down. We've got a street. We've got a building, or at least the footprint of a building. The next thing we're going to do is going to go all the way to the bottom of the town set and start grabbing the walls. Now, I made the walls and the exterior walls different. And I did this specifically so that you could um, have different weight. I wanted the exterior walls to have a heavier weight in visual appearance to uh, the uh, interior walls. So you can use both together. That's kind of the whole point. Yeah, I think I could probably control C, control V a bunch of these pieces. Yeah. <laughs> Folks in chat are like, why aren't you? Why aren't you using keyboard shortcuts? Everyone knows what these are. No, you're right. Funny enough, you have you have to be careful when you do this actually in game with tiles. The tiles themselves uh, sometimes get cranky when you try and do that to them. Yep. I have such a ha 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 what is that that was the wrong that was the wrong tool so what I tend to do whenever I'm building my interior pieces is I'll put down all the pieces that I know are identical so I had a bunch of corner brackets um yeah yeah you have to be careful sometimes if you hit the wrong button you'll switch tools and all of a sudden you'll be drawing that's not what you want to do. So uh, in this case, uh, you know, I've got a number of pieces that are, uh, I'm going to use a bunch of. So, uh, you know, best to just lay those all down first right away. In this case, I'm putting down a couple windows um, and we're going to want, uh, you know, a fair number of windows in the building. Whenever you're building a, a building, you know, windows are good. <laughs> Don't ignore windows. Um, Go ahead and get some regular ordinary walls in here. And as you can see, this building is already really starting to take shape. Um, once you kind of get the flooring down, the rest of it is almost simple by comparison. So I've got all of my exterior walls down. There are some interior post pieces that I recommend using to help kind of square off corners. Um, so, you know, you drop that in there and all of a sudden that looks like a complete wall now. Um, and these are pretty easy to use. Um, these aren't mandatory by any means. Um, I just think they uh, they add to the overall uh, look of completeness to a building, which I personally find desirable. Um, so, you know, I made sure to include pieces. So there. After that, I have all of my interior envelope done. I'm going to set aside one room over here uh, on this side as the kitchen. 
Now, these are all snap locked to uh, one edge of the square. So if you uh, grab them, you can decide, you know, oh, do I want the wall on the inside of the, you know, on the right side of this square, or do I want it on the left side of this square? And it all comes down to realizing where your lines are, your walls are gonna line up above and below. So, um, you know, just something to keep an eye on. It's really just me being more uh, more uh, obsessive compulsive over where my lines and pieces go. <laughs> um, but I can also, realizing what I've got here, start creating, you know, I want a living room, a kitchen, and a bedroom. I put the fireplace over here, so I've pretty much decided that that's going to be the kitchen we'll put that as the cooking hearth and then we'll uh, create this back room here as a bedroom leaving the other room uh, as the primary living space for our little house that we are going to adventure in now that i've got all the walls down um, that's pretty much it for the walls i have all of the uh, wall pieces set down in my building i've got three rooms one of which is a larger living room uh, then i've got uh, a bedroom and a kitchen um, pretty simple. Uh, there are some door tiles in here. We'll go ahead and put in the, uh, town door that is closed, uh, for the exterior door. We'll put the one that's slightly ajar for the bedroom. Uh, and then we'll put the one that's completely open for the kitchen. Just a matter, this is kind of a personal choice. Nothing. Oop. That ended up backwards. Come here, you. I'm gonna go ahead and flip this horizontal so that it uh, is open that way. We'll go ahead and put another door in the back. So there we go. All right, now all we need to do is put down decor. So what I've done is I've set down the floors, the walls, the streets. If I wanted to at this point in time, I could put down uh, roofs as well. This is also where you might want to put down roofs for buildings next door. So for example, if uh, you know next door up over here, there was another building, uh, I could put these down. These are designed to sit right above these wall pieces so that if you, uh, you know, if you want, you can build the roof above. What I have done sometimes is built the roof, group them all together. That way I can move them as a group and I can either delete them when the players enter or I can shift them to the back, which causes them to fall below all of the other tiles. That way the building interior is revealed. But if you're just trying to build a scene, a street scene, and you know the players aren't gonna go in the building, you can lay down all the roof tiles to cover up the flooring and just not put anything in the building at all. You don't even have to put the flooring in. You can just do the outside tracing and then drop the roof down. If you're really in a pinch, you can even skip the outside tracing. Just put the roof down and be like, yep, that's a building. You're not going in there, so I don't have to worry about it. So uh, I have played around with that. I, I do think, uh, you know, if you're, instead of using Fog of War, I include the roof tiles, especially for buildings, to be like, yeah, you enter the building, the entire roof comes off, right? You can put all the pieces down, group them, right? So if I take, uh, you know, four uh, roof pieces here, let me just let me just grab four, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, you know. So now I've got these, I can go into advanced and group them, and now they move around as a group, or at least they should if I had grabbed this one properly. So <laughs> um, that's the upside. You can move them all around as a group, and then uh, you don't have to worry about them in play. So, but otherwise, I'm ready to start throwing down decor. Now, the town set includes a whole bunch of dungeon decor. We're going to go ahead and grab a bed. 
because I already decided this was the bedroom. And you know, if you hold down Alt, you can move and shift these things and don't have to worry about snap to grid. So, but in this case, I, I, I kind of want it over along one wall. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it, uh, we'll put it here a little bit away from the window. Um, and once again, if you hold Alt, you can drop that wherever you want. Um, now there is an end table in here. We're gonna go ahead and grab that as well. It's got like a lamp on it and a scroll and some coins. We'll go ahead and drop that there. Now this is the bedroom, so we're going to go ahead and drop. There is a, um, a uh, uh, where is it? A wardrobe. We'll go ahead and grab the wardrobe. Then we'll get that over on that wall. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a bedroom, so let's go ahead and get a small chest in there as well. So there we go. That's the bedroom. Easy enough. For the living room, uh, we've got a uh, sofa that's in here. Uh, if I can find it. Oh, sorry, I, I listed it under couch. It's not a sofa, it's a couch. So we'll go ahead and get a couch in here. We'll put that down right there. We'll get uh, some of these comfortable chairs in here. And we'll put two of those in here. Maybe this, uh, uh, this house belongs to a hunter so we'll go ahead and put a dragon trophy on the wall we'll get a uh, table down because you know you got to be able to uh... they need to have been able to uh, you know eat <laughs> and hang out somewhere in this building uh, there are some ordinary uh, chairs in here that we can always put around the table. And once again, you can you can always fix things by arranging front and back, right? So if I want this dragon head to be higher placed, I just keep moving it to the front as I move things in. Ideally, if once you get, you know, really adept at this, you start looking at it by building it in layers. Right. Oh, I'm going to. I'm not going to put in the thing that is highest in the room until last. So, uh, you know, maybe there is a, a feast going on here. We can always take the feast tile, drop that in, arrange it to be on the table. But again, this dragon head keeps be needing to be moved. So we can also move the dragon head too. Right. We don't have to keep it in the same place. I just realized one of these tiles is off, is an extra. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's easy enough to drop down all the pieces that we need. There are things like, you know, to make the kitchen work, there is, um, you know, uh, there are tables you can always put down in there. Um, there is a bookcase we can drop down in the room, um, you know, things like this are uh, are here to really kind of help add detail and life to your uh, to your play spaces. Um, there is a kitchen kettle that can go over the fireplace. Oop, this is backwards. There it is. And that should snap right over the fireplace. Um, now, there's so many little details that you can add to this. Like, there are sewer grates you could put outside there are uh you know you could put a cart in the backyard um basically it all comes down to what you feel like building um you know what do you need to make your play space exciting um i generally um there's a kitchen shelf in here that is filled with tools and uh, 
things that are of use for the kitchen. And most of these are designed so that they snap right against the walls uh, of the space without too much trouble. Put a kitchen table in here. And yeah. Now let's say you want to connect your pieces together. You want to move on to your next scene. Um, so, you know, the first place they're exploring is, uh, is uh, this uh, house and there is a trap door uh, that is in the, you know, in the kitchen that leads down to some secret. And I don't even necessarily want the players to know about it, but I want to give them a hint about it. This is one of the things I love about the way these tiles work and the way that they work as PNGs is that I can then take a rug tile, right? And I can rotate it and place it so that the, the trap door is just barely visible underneath and let my players kind of go, hey, what's that underneath there? Right, they can see it, they can get a sense of what's going on, but they can't quite figure it out until later. So that's kind of how uh, you build uh, town pieces. Now let's take a look real quickly about building uh, dungeons and caves. And this actually goes faster uh, because you do get to leave a lot of negative space. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new page. I'm gonna go to this one. Once again, uh, I'm gonna set the hex to uh, uh, four, four, it always does that to me. 93BE. Now you can set this to have this be automatically that color for all pages you create. You can do that in the game setup. So if you're going to be using, uh, you know, blue tiles for everything, uh, you can easily just set that and then you don't have to do it every time. So I'm going to go ahead and set that. And while I'm doing this, I'm also going to turn on dynamic lighting. Uh, and for the moment, I'm going to turn on global illumination, but I am going to turn that on off uh, eventually. So uh, we're gonna go in here and we're just gonna set this to uh, height. We're gonna drop it down to 10 again, just to make it manageable. Uh, width, we'll go 15 on this one. Um, oh, and that didn't stick. And there we go. So uh, now I've got uh, kind of a larger dungeon space here that I can play with. So I've got my trap door from above, and we're going to go ahead and assume that that leads down into some weird dungeon underneath. I have seen folks layer all of this stuff on one map. I tend not to do that. I tend to build individual encounter areas in one map and transition between them. First of all, this reduces the kind of load time for an individual map because you're not loading the entire damn thing. Uh, and two, it allows you to build it in more discrete parts, um, which can make things a little easier for you. You don't have to build the entire dungeon before it's ready to go. You can just build the parts that you're going to encounter that week. So I'm gonna go ahead and into the uh, dungeon tile set here. And much like with the city tile set, uh, the best thing you can do is really start by laying down some floors. So in this case, I've got some floor pieces that are rather large, um, right? I've got a three by three here, and uh, maybe this room's uh, a little bigger than three by three. So I'm gonna go ahead and create, I'm gonna make it four by three. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop another couple floor pieces in here to get that to work. And there we go. I've also uh, decided that I'm going to have some uh, corridor leading out of this room. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and grab the corridor piece because I have those. And I'm gonna assume that it's gonna do something like that. And then it's going to lead to a uh, larger chamber that has uh, an altar in it. And I'm just kind of making this up as I go along. Obviously you probably have more of a game plan for your uh, adventure, but uh, for this tutorial, this is gonna work out just fine. So, you know, you start out with something simple. Um, now, the great part about these is they're designed so that I could put this right here. I can also put it there. I can build all the pieces around it as needed. And I'll show you how some of that works. So if you go into the dungeon set uh, and you go down to the dungeon wall pieces, um, obviously, uh, these are pretty easy to work with. They come in, you know, one, three, and five. So unlike the city set where there's, it tends to just be one by ones, this has a bunch of larger pieces to make it easier for you to build quickly. Um, so in fact, I can take the dungeon inside corner 
take this and literally just drop it right on the corner and fill out that entire corner piece. Now, like I said, these pieces are designed so that you can layer them all over the place without too much trouble, but some of the pieces don't play well together. These two don't play well together because of this uh, dead space that you end up creating by doing that. But there are fortunately plenty of ways around that. So instead of putting that down, we're gonna go ahead and put this piece right here. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and grab the corner piece. Dungeon wall corner. Where is it? There it is. And this piece will sit right over the corridor piece and you can't tell the difference. Likewise, the narrow wall end will also sit right over that piece and you can't tell the difference. All of these tiles are designed in such a way that in, in as many cases as it was feasibly possible, uh, I made it so that you can just drop other pieces on top of them and not really notice any difference. Um, this is just to make your life easier as a builder um, because you got things to do and building a dungeon shouldn't take you, you know, three hours. So, um, like I said, you can just kind of grab the pieces, build in, fill in the walls. With relative ease. This set also includes something interesting because I'm using wall fill. Um, you can uh, go in and dump in these corner wall fill pieces to once again, fill in the detail. Just like with the posts up above, this is kind of the same thing. These come in a couple varieties. There's a, um, if you look into the, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, gallery view of all the pieces, there's one that's a JPEG that is fills the whole square. And then there's a one that's a PNG that's only a corner. At some point in time, I'll show you why you might want to use the PNG sometimes, but wherever possible, you want to use the JPEG because it's smaller on your system resources. Uh, the PNGs, if you have a lot of them on a map, it can start bogging down the load time uh, as the system has to render all of the pieces. Come here, you. paste go ahead and spin this around to the right direction and there we go that's the first room uh i'm gonna go ahead and rotate this this way we'll put it we'll put it right here now i'm gonna go and grab just a chunk of dungeon corridor here i'm gonna rotate this into place and you'll notice this is the spot where all of a sudden this being a full-size png is causing me a problem because if I put it down there, it gets covered up by the piece. If I move it to the front, now it's blocking and covering up part of the corridor. So we're gonna go ahead and delete it. And we're gonna go down and grab the PNG corner fill. Come here, you. Stop it. There we are. And this piece is gonna do what we need it to do. It allows us to fill in our corner while not covering up the piece because the rest of the tile is transparent. So in some cases, it's just about making your life easy, uh, allowing you to kind of add a full detail to the, the, the piece um, without uh, getting too uh, mired in, uh, in layout. floor. I realized in building this set that uh, the dungeon corridor pieces would really save me a whole bunch of time because they would allow me to lay down corridor very quickly without having to build both walls and then the floor in between. So, um, you know, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, so one thing I want to showcase here before we get too far into this is the fact that these sets are really are designed to fit together. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and grab one of the conversion pieces that takes me from dungeon to cavern. And I'm gonna go and put this piece into my layout. 
So I'm going to go ahead and put it right. Uh, let's see. We'll put it right here. And that'll be the edge of this room. So in the cavern set, there are um, there are conversion pieces to take you from dungeon to cavern. Because um, I kind of assumed that everybody would pick up dungeon first. Um, and that cavern would be the add-on buy, which is pretty much played out. I think I've seen a lot more people pick up dungeon than cavern so far. But the cavern set is filled with some great stuff and really does allow you to do a lot more things uh, than you can just do with the dungeon set. The dungeon set's really basic, um, and intentionally so. It's, uh, it's designed to be kind of your starter set that has uh, kind of all the base pieces to build a dungeon, but isn't really there to, uh, you know, allow you to build everything under the sun, unless it's a basic dungeon, which, you know, it does a pretty good job. Again, I should be using copy paste, but you know, old habits die hard. Now, this is another interesting spot where I've got a long enough wall here. This is a five long wall. And uh, I can make that work by just bringing this to the front and you can't really tell the difference. So um, allows me to kind of lay down wall quickly and efficiently. So I've got some, my, some dungeon wall built here. I'm going to go quickly into the cavern set and lay down uh, some cavern pieces to uh, help uh, build that out a bit. So I'm going to go down into the cavern walls. And the cavern walls um, work much like the dungeon walls. They're very similar in structure and layout. There are corners, there are walls, there are inside corners and outside corners. Right, um, so on the whole, not a very difficult set, although it can require you to kind of wrap your brain around how some of the pieces are working because you can do very, very different things with it. Um, I like to play around with things and make like crevasses and little corners and things for the players to uh, explore and for me to hide monsters in, right? I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> That's kind of why you're doing this is to put you know, monsters in places. So, uh, you know, you can do things like that and create a narrow, uh, tiny uh, crevasse um, without too much trouble, right? Uh, the sets really do kind of allow you to do that without, uh, without, without too many headaches. Um, so, let's see. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and grab one of the bigger pieces here. So I'm trying to make some kind of narrow twists and turns, um, you know, just to make this feel more like a, a narrow little crevice that has to be explored. Um, this piece is actually too big. That's not the piece I was looking for. I am looking for the one by one. So that I, I'm, I'm creating a space that the players are going to have to kind of squeeze through uh, to explore. And then I can have it open up into a uh, larger chamber back here where I can put um, whatever monster uh, I want to hide back in my, in my dungeon. Might as well play around with some of the crystal pieces. I really like these pieces. They turned out uh, really quite good.
I even want to leave myself an out so that I can continue exploring uh, further down and go off the map to a new map. Or, you know, I could always go back and expand out this piece and make it bigger as well. Let me just finish this off here before I get too far off into the reeds. Dungeon floor. Come here, you. And I'm actually going to go ahead and grab the 2x2. Two two. Because once again, if you take that and drop it to the back, now it fills in my spaces. So, without too much, too much trouble, right? You can you can see how this easily builds out kind of very variable dungeons. I didn't really have a goal or a purpose with this. I just was kind of playing with pieces. And again, there are cavern fill uh, corners here that if you want to play around with these, they allow you to kind of fill out the texturing in the corners so that it looks complete. Um, there are, of course, a lot of different um, uh, tokens and uh, decor, uh, decor pieces that you can put in here, like, oh, maybe there's mushrooms growing in the uh, cave entrance. So that uh, before the players can get there, they have to deal with hallucinogenic mushrooms, or maybe some sort of mushroom monster has decided to grow in the area. There is, uh, you know, there's bridges and chasms and rubble. So, and you can always play and mix and match these. So maybe some of the rubble spilled into the room from where uh, this cave-in happened. Uh, and this could be some difficult terrain in that area, right? Blocking uh, the player's ease of entrance. I can always go back to the dungeon set and add, you know, strange statues. Uh, I can, entertainingly enough, right, I put a trapdoor in above from the town set. Well, the town set includes a, uh, a ladder. So I can take this piece and make it the ladder to which you get up and down from the, uh, from the chamber up above, right? So that's how they get into this dungeon, you know? There can be statues. There are, of course, doors for the dungeon as well. And again, all of this stuff is pretty interchangeable. Now, some of the pieces don't fit the same way because the dungeon walls are sized slightly differently than the uh, walls up above. But there's, there's, there's not going to be too many challenges resizing the pieces. You can always stretch, grab, and uh, shift the tiles around. Uh, in ways that are going to make it work a little better. Um, yeah, I, I find that there's, you know, there, there could be a well down here in the dungeon too now, right? This is something from, once again, the tile set, the town tile set has a well. So maybe there's a well down here in the dungeon. Perfectly fine. You can mix and match a lot of these pieces. I have seen some folks do some incredible things with some of these pieces, you know, this dungeon has a giant owlbear, a stuffed owlbear in the middle of it as well. Why? Don't know. Maybe that's the story I'm trying to tell. But a lot of these pieces really are interchangeable. So you can take bits from the dungeon tile set, bits from the town tile set. You can play with all of them together to make the dungeon that you want. Um, so uh, before we're done here, I want to talk about dynamic lighting in these. So, um, you know, uh, if you recall earlier, uh, I set the uh, global illumination on. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off for just a moment. And that's going to make my, my set look darker. I'm going to go ahead and drop down to the dyna dynamic lighting level. And this is the, the, the current version of dy dynamic lighting. I know they're working on an advanced. I'm not using that just yet. I always like to set my, uh, my wall color to blue and things that I might remove to red. And basically, when you're working with dynamic lighting, you're just going to draw an outline. And I like to draw it from around the middle of the square doesn't have to be super exact but you know the more you can get the better don't ever draw curved lines you know you can do this sort of stuff that's fine but uh, curved lines are gonna make the system crash <laughs> pretty badly so don't draw them On the other side here, I'm going to start here. We'll go down here, there, there, 
there, there. And all I'm doing is determining boundaries to which the light cannot uh, penetrate. You don't have to be super exact with this. The goal isn't to make it perfect. The goal is to make it so that the light um, looks relatively, you know, is relatively confined to the spaces the players can see. Now, let's say I want this door here to be something that blocks light when the players first enter. I highly recommend changing your color and then drawing, you know, your door in. So you can do things like, actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and back up on that. You can do things like this. And what you've done now is created a, a block for the light that um, you can then easily see, pick, and remove. You can see it because it's a different color, and you can pick it uh, using the pick tool, right? Um, because it's an individual. If, if I were to try and pick, you know, if I made it part of this, I would get the whole line across the entire thing, which would screw up my entire lighting effect. So you always want to do those separate for the ones you want to be able to uh, delete. So I've gone ahead and, and just made a, a token here of good old Thulcan Talamir. We're going to we're gonna dump him in the dungeon. Here he is. He's our hero. He has a torch with him. It's going to be 40, 20 is the dim. All players can see light. This token has sight. And now you can see that it's emitting light. If I want to see what that looks like from the player perspective, I'm going to go ahead and hit rejoin as player. And I just realized I'm on the wrong map. So I'm going to go back to rejoin as GM. I do this every time. One of the things you need to keep an eye on is where the players are. So when I click rejoin as player, I can't see anything if I'm not there. So uh, I also just realized that I think I put him on the lighting layer. So I'm going to go ahead and move him from the lighting layer to the token layer. Go to the token layer. And now we'll hit rejoin as player. There we go. And now all I can see is the room that I'm in. And I can see there's a door there. There's obviously something behind it. But until I go through it, I don't know what's back there. The lighting won't let me. So when I go back to uh, the view as a GM, this now allows me to go back and see everything. Um, I can, of course, go to the dynamic lighting layer during play. I can select this barrier, and when the players open the door, I can remove it, which will allow their light to flow into the new area. If I want to see how the light's playing, I can always make a token with light and move it around so that I can watch the light effects change as the tokens move through the dungeon. I kind of love this little effect. Um, you can set it so that it only changes the light when a token stops moving, um, which will greatly reduce the uh, server and load time. But, you know, while I'm playing around with it here, I might as well show it off, right? It looks pretty great. Um, you know, that's probably good enough dynamic lighting. I can see the mushrooms. I can't see around the corner. That's probably fine. You can do more complex things, like with bars and statues and stuff, and have them block light and not show what's behind them. There's so many different things you can play around with. Um, you can, of course, have a character selected and hit Control... What is that? L? And see what they see, right? So you don't have to change the, as them. And keyboard shortcuts. There's a lot of them from Roll20. I don't have them all mastered, but uh, that does allow you to quickly check... what the lighting looks like from that character's perspective, which is cool. Um, so uh, as for me, the big tips and tricks that I like to pay attention to is uh, making sure to layer tires, tiles over each other. I do love to create uh, little secrets. So, uh, you know, let's go back to my map layer. And let's say I want to put a pit in this dungeon. So I go in here and in the dungeon set, there is a pit. There's a bunch of different ways I can do this. I can take this pit and I'm going to say, there's a pit trap right here. Get back there, rubble. There's a pit trap right on the inside of the door. Now, obviously, I don't want that to be visible when the players enter. There's two ways I can do this. I can move it to the GM token layer, which works just fine. Uh, because then all I have to do while I'm playing is go back to the GM uh, token layer, grab this piece, and change it to the token layer and now all of a sudden it's visible to the players 
That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to take this and send it to the back. Uh, put it on the map layer and send it all the way to the back. So now it's invisible. Then all you have to do is go to the map layer during play, click on the thing that's in front of it and send it to the back and now the trap appears. You can play with both of those methods uh, during play. I like to do uh, layered effects and sending them to the back when I'm doing something that is super obvious and I know I wanna play with it and I want it to be visible during play. Um, that is one easy way you can do it. So you have two different ways you can do that, moving things to the jam layer or shifting things to the back, both work. Um, also, uh, you know, while we're talking about, uh, you know, things that we are building, I do want to note that one of the things that, uh, you really want to make sure that you utilize with a set like this. So I'm going to go back here to the town set and I'm going to say, you know, Hey, these chairs are great. I love them. So I'm going to put a whole bunch of chairs around this table. Now you can certainly, you know, add a whole bunch of chairs to the table, um, I'm going to move the food out of the way. I'll put the food in the kitchen for now. Um, but the more of you, these you do, the more they will become very, very, very repetitive just because they are all perfectly aligned. They all sit within the square the same way. I highly recommend holding down the alt button and just giving them all a little bit of a twist, a little bit of a turn. It really does a lot to kind of improve the look of the space and make it look far more dynamic and lived in than if everything's just in a perfect row, right? If you're doing a bar and you're going to grab, you know, the bar stool and you just start putting down, you know, bar stool after bar stool after bar stool and you don't do anything with them. I just realized I put those behind my head so no one could see what I was doing. Let me move over here. So you're just putting down bar stool after bar stool after bar stool. It does so much for the space just to shift a few of them a little. Doesn't have to be dramatic. Doesn't have to be anything huge. But just doing tiny little shifts makes it look more of a natural space. One of the things that is a challenge with Roll20, I know we're all, we're all tight on time, but when you just take the pieces and put them in and snap them to grid, everything looks identical and everything looks too perfect. Holding down alt, moving things around, really does help shift up the space and make it look more uh, lived in. And lastly, my last big tip is to make sure to share between sets. Um, there is so many things you can do, especially with my blue map tiles, but with really all the sets on Roll20, um, that when you share sets together, uh, you really can make some really exciting things. I think that is just about going to cover it. I have had a lot of fun making these uh, tile sets for everybody. I really do hope that you have been enjoying using them. Um, the Blue Maps uh, tile sets are available on the Roll20 store now. You can find them by looking for Blue Maps in the marketplace or by searching for Minotaur Games. That's the company that they're under. That's my private imprint. So you can find them all there. I hope this tutorial uh, was of use to you and you found it uh, kind of fun and interesting watching me uh, play around and build some dungeons uh, in the Roll20 environment. I hope you have uh, enjoyed playing with Blue Maps. If there are new sets that you want to see or tiles that you really wish you uh, had, leave me a comment down below. Uh, toss it uh, in the video uh, here on YouTube and let me know. I'm always looking for more ideas. I'm currently thinking about possibly doing an expansion to the dungeon set next. So more dungeon pieces, not basic dungeon pieces, doing things around some tight themes. I'm trying to get the base sets done and then I'm going to focus on some expansions that really add tools to the sets we already have. So I hope you've been enjoying those. Uh, I have certainly been enjoying making them and putting them out. Uh, I think that's about all I got for today. If you want to learn more about me and my work on Pathfinder and stuff, you can follow me on all the various social medias, uh, backslash Jason Bullman, J-A-S-O-N-B-U-L-M-A-H-N. That's about all I got for today, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. We will see you next time.